Hey folks, welcome back to another new series. Uh, we're going to be building a fully functional F# -sharp web API. Uh, fully functional uh, means two things. It will be fully functional, so it will do things like saving stuff to a database, and you could, will be able to call your REST API with a uh, with clients. But uh, the second meaning, the double entendre here, fully functional part is we are going to build it in a functional style. So what that means. We'll be figuring that out as we go, uh, but it will look a bit different than what we're used to. We will be staying in the .NET world, so if you have seen controllers and ASP.NET Web API, uh, you will feel right at home with the big building blocks, but once we dive in how we structure applications, how we build our business logic, how we persist stuff to the database, uh, that will all uh, look a bit different, maybe. So yeah, uh, that's uh, the rough outline of this series and uh, in episode one we will be building a, a walking skeleton so just the basic hello world to get us up and running uh, but before we do uh, let me first uh, shout out uh, this book the book is called from objects to functions build your software faster and safer with functional programming and kotlin by uberto barbini uh, and that's the book where i got this idea from it's a great book it's a is it an expert level book? Yeah, it's a. I have it right here, a paper copy, and it's one of my the only books I have uh, from pragmatic programmers where it's like expert level. <laughs> uh, but don't worry, uh, I'm here to guide you along. Uh, but this book uh, is basically the table of contents of what we will be doing here, mm, but then in F sharp. Uh, the book itself uh, uses Kotlin and Kotlin libraries. It's a language in the JVM uh, ecosystem. But uh, if you look at the tools we will be using, uh, the Giraffe framework, it's a one-on-one -on -one replacement for the HTTP for Kotlin library they use. And we will be staying very close to uh, the same ideas and concepts. But where Kotlin and f -sharp will diverge, we of course are going to do the f -sharp way and not the Kotlin way. Uh, so we're going to riff on the main theme of the book, but some Somewhere along the road, we might digress a little to do things in a more F-sharp style. There's some uh, divergences. Uh, so that's where we got our uh, ideas and our inspiration. Uh, and this is a broad overview of the entire series. Um, we will be live coding, so uh, I will have prepared a bit, but I will be uh, writing the app uh, live on camera. Uh, so you can uh, struggle along. And uh, the main goal for this is to show you that uh, it does not always flow super easy uh, and how an experienced engineer uh, tackles uh, walls and obstacles. <laughs> so that's also part of this series. Uh, as I said, we will be writing idiomatic F sharp. So we will not be writing a uh, Kotlin in F sharp. We will be doing uh, it in a uh, proper F sharp. Uh, we will be test driving our code. Uh, it's not obligatory, but uh, it's the way I am most comfortable um, writing new code or writing a code in an existing codebase, and we will be uh, tackling some nasty bits. Uh, if you look at web APIs, um, a lot of it is very straightforward, very simple, uh, but functional programming gets tricky when you have side effects like reading and writing stuff from a database. Maybe that's a good thing to visualize. Uh, so uh, if you take a look at what is a web server exactly? So, so this is my web server. Uh, what is a web server? Uh, it's actually pretty basic. It's something that takes requests, does stuff, and it uh, might return uh, a response, or it always returns a response, uh, if it's up at least. <laughs> and it, uh, internally, it does some things. It like decides uh, uh, what logic to trigger. So it does routing, it checks whether or not you're al allowed to access the, the endpoints. Does it so it does security. It also does things like uh, business logic, it contains logic most of the time. And then it has uh, side effects or like hidden uh, surprises like persistence. It reads and writes from a database or from a persistence store and logging, stuff like that. So there's a lot more going on here. Uh, but most of these things, if you take a look, if you zoom out uh, like we just did here, um, most of these things are like a pure mathematical function. Stuff goes in, you have inputs, there's a black box doing stuff, and 
stuff goes out. You have outputs. I wouldn't go as far as to call this a pure function, <laughs> because depending on what happens uh, in here, uh, you might not always get the same results. Uh, but uh, you could look at, at the web server as a function, uh, more or less. Things get a bit tricky, uh, or get very tricky once you do things like persistence, because then you have hidden side effects, and that's not something uh, functional programmers tend to like or tend to uh, find very cool in their code. So this series will be about how we tackle those nasty bits. We will not be doing all the nasty bits. We will not dive into security, stuff like that. But if you've seen one side effect, like uh, reading and writing from a database, you will uh, have a, a grasp and an understanding on how all these things uh, are done in a functional uh, way. So back to uh, the, the overview of this series. Oh yeah, so uh, we are going to do some nasty bits, uh, but the most important part of the series is we will be deep diving into functional concepts. So yes, we will be taking a look at how you write a web app using immutable data, uh, what all those functional terms mean, like a referential transparency, a partial application, currying, stuff like that. And yes, we will be uh, diving into some more advanced concepts like monoids, functors, applicative functors, and the scary M word. But we won't go super deep, we will go deep enough to get a grasp on what it is, basic, uh, but most importantly, what you can do with it and what it provides uh, if you use these concepts. And finally, um, if you take a look at modern software architectures or uh, backend designs, uh, these buzzwords you see here, CQRS, event sourcing, and projections, those are terms that are pretty advanced, but they mesh or they complement functional programming nicely. So um, as the book does, and as we will be doing, we will be applying these uh, designs and uh, architectural principles or architectural styles in our backend as well. So yeah, uh, that's uh, all the topics we will be covering. And of course, the code will be available on GitHub. Um, these are the 10 episodes, or at least right now, I don't know if I'm going to stick <laughs> with this outline. But for now, this is the outline of the series. Today, we will build, be building a walking skeleton. So that's basically a walking, talking, uh, very lightweight uh, version of our API that walks like a skeleton and dances like a skeleton. So it will be the entire thing as, as expect uh, without the functionality. <laughs> and then we will be building uh, on top of that in the coming episodes. So uh, in the next episode, we will build a couple of features, a bit of functionality. And then we will be talking about events that signify state changes. And then we will go the whole uh, event sourcing route. We will rebuild our state from events. We'll take a look at some functional concepts uh, so we can do better error handling in our API. And then we are going to take a look at CQRS, so Command Query Responsibility Segregation and how that works together or not with event sourcing. Um, in the final episodes, we'll tackle the nasty bits like uh, database persistence and input validation, because that's also a pretty advanced concept. If you take a look at the building blocks we will be using, and we will end up with a nice what have we learned recap. Uh, so that's the idea. And that is all I have uh, for introduction. Maybe one slide uh, detour uh, on the giraffe homepage because we will be building on top of asp.net we will be building on top of the kestrel web server but we will not be using asp.net web api or mvc we will be using a more functional library called giraffe and giraffe is an f sharp micro web framework for building rich web applications <laughs> that's a dense uh, sentence uh, but we'll just uh, do our walking skeleton uh, we'll grab uh, or hello world from here and let's see what a functional web api looks like first things first let's create a new project so it can be an asp.net core app because uh, giraffe builds on top of that it does not host its own web server so let's use a new asp.net core and let's call it zetai Oh yeah, I have not uh, told uh, or explained what we will be building, which might be relevant. <laughs> it will be a to-do app, a very basic to-do app uh, where you can create new to-do lists, add items to lists, 
um, mark items as done. They have due dates, so we can take a look at the next most important thing, stuff like that. Uh, but the functionality here is taking like a, a second, uh, it's the passenger seat because we will mainly be focusing on functional uh, programming and how you build web apps that way. So uh, long story short, we will be building a to-do app and we are calling our app Zetai, uh, which means it's Japanese and it means something like, yeah, definitely, absolutely, things will get done. That's why I'm using Zetai. It's the same name uh, the book uses. I did not uh, study Japanese. Anywho, we are building a .NET 8 uh, web API. We don't need Docker. I have a directory already there because I played around with it, uh, but I think we're good to go. No, we're not good to go. What in the, what in the world is all this? <laughs> There's a lot of uh, obsolete folders here. Let me just clean that up. I forget that those exist. There we go. So if you are programming in .NET uh, Web API, all these things look familiar. There's an app settings file and there's a um, program dot fs because we're using c sharp f sharp so uh, but it's the main method uh, as you know and love it in c sharp as well uh, let's take a look at what dependencies are pulled in we have asp.net core and f sharp core of course and our hello world app uh, without giraffe looks something like this it's using the map get kind of thing so it's not using controllers uh, but we'll be ripping this out in a second. So this is working. We have a running a uh, web server. Let's now pull in uh, Giraffe, the F# -sharp, uh, lightweight micro <laughs> micro library for micro web frameworks. There we go. And let's grab Hello World from the Giraffe website. So we have ASP.NET Core that checks out. We have Giraffe. Let me zoom it a bit. There we go. And then we have to create a web app. It's a couple lines of code more than we had for the vanilla ASP.NET one. Uh, but it's not that bad. So we see the same main method and we see the same ASP.NET config. But there's one line that's a bit different and that's this one. We are using... No, sorry. I'm not used to this style. I'm used to this style, so it's saying here, you can uh, also write things in a more functional way. Let's do that. <laughs> that looks a bit more dense, a bit more elegant. Let's grab this Hello World example. So uh, again, you see the same uh, entry points, but there's a couple of differences. We configure our dependencies in our app here. We configure our app or middleware uh, and there's only one middleware we're registering, which is the Giraffe middleware itself. And in our dependencies or service collection, we register all the services Giraffe needs. And that's it for the rest that we're just building an ASP.NET backend. Uh, this thing is the important thing. If you see uh, where we register our middleware, we use something or we inject something called the web app. And this, my friends, is our functional web server. This looks a bit weird, right? It's a, uh, uh, let's take a look at the function signature here. This web app is a function that takes an uh, HTTP func and an HTTP context and it returns an HTTP func result. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, but what does it actually mean? What are we doing here? If you take a look again at this drawing, uh, we are actually building a function that represents this uh, middle square. So we, we're building a function uh, where we have routing, where we can do security, where we can dispatch to our business logic, stuff like that. And here we have uh, routing. So this choose thing is a router. Choose uh, takes a list of HTTP handlers and uh, it selects the right one for you. And here you see uh, the routing in action. This is saying if the route or the URL is slash ping, uh, trigger this uh, handler, trigger this lo logic. If the route is root, trigger this one. So that's uh, what you're seeing here. So this is routing and calling the business logic. There's a bit more to it than that, but we'll get there when we get there. So right now let's do a hello world. 
and let's return hello world from from giraffe exclamation mark all, right, all these weird operators that's something functional programmers tend to like <laughs> uh this is a i don't know what the official term is is this the fun Kleisley thing i'm not sure actually i'm uh, not a pure functional programming uh, uh I'm not sure actually this looks like a different error right it's not that important we don't need to know all these names yeah actually uh, i think i'm on the money uh, if you want to know more about pure functional programming in f sharp uh, mark zeman clue has a great resource this website uh, scott vlashin also has f sharp for fun and profit that's also a great resource those are like my two main uh, uh, resources for f sharp programming Next to my own stuff, of course. But if you want to know more, uh, those are two great ones to get started. Anyway, uh, this is routing, and we have our hello world thing. And this magical arrow combines our routing logic with our what to do uh, business logic. And our business logic right now just returns an HTTP uh, text response containing this string. So let's see this in action. What port is our server? Okay, there it was. Uh, Hostname cannot be found because we have nothing on index. Yeah, let's maybe put our hello world on index because our app bootstraps on index. Okay, so hello world is working. We have a running web app. Uh, let's call this hello zetai user so this is our walking skeleton almost i would like to do one more thing this episode we're only 17 minutes in we have time i would write uh, like to wrap some tests around this because i'm uh, a big fan of test driven development and now that we have our spike we have our walking skeleton up and running or our spike at least uh, when i finish a walking skeleton like okay now i can start writing features uh, uh, at full speed I need to have my TDD loop in place, and that's something I would like to do right now. Uh, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to uh, have an easy way to run uh, example HTTP requests against my API, and I'm going to write some automated tests uh, that target my API. So integration tests, if you will, slow integration tests that uh, run my entire system. So first thing first, I want an easy way to uh, play around with my API. And you could use something like Swagger or Postman. Uh, but recently I uh, discovered something else that's like built into VS Code and Visual Studio. And I'm gonna quickly uh, show that because uh, I'm, I'm quite a the big fan of it. It's called HTTP files. So if I create a new file, I call it requests. Name doesn't matter, but if I have a HTTP extension, a Visual Studio kind of recognizes this and there you go i can now write http requests for example get what's my url again where is my server running there it is so my server is running on 7280 uh, so if i uh, back to my http file if i do get this url and my route is root slash uh, I, this magical button appears send requests if I press this button, I do the actual HTTP request. So this is just a poor man's alternative for Postman, stuff like that. And here you see the result. Hello, Zeti user. I do not know why the user is purple. <laughs> that is super weird. And you see things like execution time, uh, HTTP response codes, payload size, stuff like that. So it's pretty useful. You can also inspect headers. So for all intents and purposes, uh, for everything we will be needing in this series, our HTTP files will be good enough to play around with. So this is how I will be playing around with my API if I'm not writing tests. Next, let's write some actual tests. Um, it's not really necessary to introduce a new project. 
because our, it will be a small tutorial project, but let's write a new class library just for fun. Let's call it ZI tests. Also .NET 8, of course. There we go. And let's have it reference our ZTI web app. There we go. And let's write some integration tests, shall we? For that, we need some more Nugget packages. I am a fan of XUnit uh, as a test runner. So let's install XUnit. For that, I need XUnit core. I need a couple of Nougat packages and I prepared those beforehand. So that's what I'm doing here. Uh, I need XUnit. I need some kind of integration for Visual Studio. The Visual Studio Runner, there we go. And for my assertions in F Sharp, I don't like to use the XUnit assertions, but I like to use something called Unquote. I use it for my advent of code series as well. So if you've seen that, you've seen Unquote before. And otherwise, we will dive into it in a second. And uh, for writing integration tests against ASP.NET and Kestrel, because that's what our Giraffe is built on top of, we need two more libraries. One is the ASP.NET Core.MVC.Testing library. And the other one is called... No, that's it actually. And then there's this one last one that I kind of always have to install if I want to run my tests in Visual Studio, and I still don't understand why. Principal level engineer right here. <laughs> but there we go. Everything should build. And let's write a single Hello World test. Uh, XUnit uses facts, so if I write a fact attribute, I don't know what the correct way is to uh, put function names between brackets or between quotes. Let's look that up in a second. Let's first write a hello world test. Uh, if you, you know XUnit, you know stuff like this. So it's, where is it? XUnit dot assert. Yeah, you, you know, it's the assert dot equals uh, uh, the actual, uh, the expected value and the actual value, stuff like that. But I don't like doing that in F Sharp. I like using unquote. So let's open uh, Swenson unquote. And let's write an unquote test. What does that look like? Why does it not recognize unquote? Did I not just install that? I thought I installed. Ah, oh, no, I'm installing all my dependencies in the ZI project, not in the testing project. <laughs> Whoops. Let's quickly fix that. So let's grab my dependencies. Giraffe, I need. All the other ones are for my tests, not for my web app itself. So let's get rid of that here. And let's introduce that in the ZI tests. Let's do that in two steps. So I'm going to copy paste the entire thing, put that in here. I've seen too much MS built in my life. I should not be able to do this. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah. And everything except Giraffe can get out. We don't need that in our web API. So I did a big, big step. Let's see if my API is running. No, I already broke my, <laughs> I already broke my uh, web app or no. What is broken actually? Why is this a one or more projects have changes which cannot be automatically handled by the project system? I have to press a button, really? Wow. Okay. But anyway, I ripped out out this the project file, so let's see if our app still works. Uh, hello, Zeti user. That looks great. So yeah, that works. I'm sorry for this detour. I was installing packages in the wrong project. We're good to go now. So now I should be able to open Swenson. Why is it still not recognizing Swenson? Oh, because my namespace declaration has to come first. Of course, the more you know. Let's 
namespaces cannot contain values. Interesting. Okay, this looks better. Now it does not recognize fact. That's okay. That's because I have not imported it or opened the module. And okay, so we are writing a hello world. And this is what an end quote assertion looks like. Unquote, sorry. Uh, it's test function and then a quoted expression, which is uh, somewhat like a lambda, I guess, but it's uh, an expression in F sharp between quotes. That's why we call it a quoted expression. And that's why unquote is called unquote. It unquotes the quoted expression by uh, evaluating it and seeing whether or not it succeeds, whether or not the predicate returns true. So let's write something that returns false. One plus three does not equal two. So this is a failing predicate. So this should be a failing test. So let's write, run this failing test. There we go. And you see here uh, why I love X unquote. Uh, it, I can write an assertion like this. So it can be a super complicated function call, whatever. Uh, and it evaluates it step by step. So I see my original expression, it reduces it and then it reduces it again until it has true, false, exception, whatever. And then you can uh, actually see all these steps in between when you are looking at a red test, which makes uh, very easy to write very high level assertions, but still have the very low level feedback of a test failure. So it's the best of both worlds somewhat. And that's why I like it. Uh, but okay, this is a hello world test, but let's actually test our hello world endpoint, right? In order to do that, let's grab a blog post. I think it's a blog post or a uh, .NET integration test. This one, integration tests in ASP.NET Core. And it uh, shows you that we have to install this package. We already did that. And then it's saying, OK, now you kind of have to run a test server. I'm looking for the test server part. This is how you create a client for your test server. Where is the actual, where is the actual test server? I've done it that many times that I cannot find it in the <laughs> example. Ah, it should be somewhere in here. In memory test server, duh, 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 duh. Test accounting group, web application factory, streamlining the SUT. I don't need to streamlining, I just want to create a new test server. Should be able to find that in a doc somewhere. And of course, we're on the home page of ESP.NET. Okay, let's see if I can build this from first principles from memory. <laughs> Famous last words. So let's try the test that bootstraps uh, in memory test server using that uh, ASP net core MVC testing nugget. So first we need to build uh, the in memory test server itself. Uh, and it should be it should be this one. So this is the test server and uh, we can new it up. And let's take a look at the constructor arguments here. So now we're we're calling constructors. This is like you see the C sharp and the object oriented programming. But once we have this hello world walking skeleton build, we can forget about all that messy integration and we can dive into pure functional stuff. So this will be the, the last time you see stuff like this. Uh, so yeah, anyhow, uh, what are arguments for this test server? It takes an iWebhost builder. So let's new that up. I don't actually know where. Uh, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> I love enterprise computer, enterprise hardware. I hope my stream is not cut in 30 minutes. Otherwise, I will be very angry. Um, Web host builder is, where is it declared? I don't actually know. Let's extract that into a variable and hopefully the sharper can help us. There we go. So where is web host builder? It's in ASP.NET 
for dot hosting. Uh, okay, there we go. And let's also open up this namespace. There we go. So we don't need this fully qualified name. This should work. It is, if my auto formatting is not screwing up by inserting new lines, there we go. So now my test server is running, I think at least. Yeah, it's running. Uh, and now I can create a client that talks against this in-memory server by using server, or let's declare a variable client, and that's server.create client. And that should build the client that talks against my in-memory server. And now I can just issue HTTP requests. So now I can do uh, get of the root. I think that was our root route. Let's take a look at our routing again. Yeah, so we route index or root to this hello world response. So if we call get a sync of root, we should get hello world. Uh, get a sync returns a task. That's something you know from C sharp probably. Um, I'm gonna write some black magic now, but I'm not gonna dive into the details because it's not relevant. Uh, it's basically how you work with asynchronous stuff, but that's not the, the, fun the main uh, concept of uh, today's video. So uh, let's not worry about this too much. How do I create a task? How do I run a task? That's how I run a sync, but how do I convert a task to an async? <laughs> um, it's been a while. From continuation, sleep, start, start as task. Switch, no, no. Oh my god. Is there a task module? There is not. So maybe let's do sync. Yeah, that works. Okay. So it's even a bit of black magic for me, but this is how you do a sync in F sharp. And if you look at the type for response, you see that it's a task. That's not what I'm expecting, actually. <laughs> Return from I what? Come on, give me the return value. Ah, oh, come on, I have to look this up. It's something I have looked up in preparation, but I already forgot. <laughs> uh, yep, 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 yep. How do you? You should consider using task over a sync if you're interoperating with .NET that uses tasks. That's very much what we're doing. So let's use task and not a sync. Okay, 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 cool. How do I run a task? That's all I'm looking for. It's not saying it. I know I can do dot .wait, but that's so not functional. Oh, there it is. A sync start as task. No, that's not. That's the other way around. Sorry. <laughs> I cannot believe I'm not uh, finding this. Uh, let me speak at my preparation just a second here. There we go. Let's take a look at my previous commits. I have like a dry run. There we go. This is very not relevant. This is the piece of code I was looking for. Let's take a look at what I'm doing wrong here. A sync await task. Oh, this was the magic I was looking for. I am sorry. And there we go. So, so we have to get root. Are you okay, Visual Studio? Are you are you okay? <laughs> I don't understand why the formatting or the syntax highlighting is all wrong. Okay, no, it's still super wrong. What's wrong here? 
Oh, it's because root is... Okay, I have to escape this string. I'm sorry for this. We'll get there. We'll get there. Is that not how I escape a string? Yeah, my Visual Studio is super slow. That's the problem. Uh, so, yeah, this was what I was trying to do. So I was trying to call an asynchronous method. And this let bang return task black magic and this async stuff, that's what makes the magic work. But we'll never have to touch that again, so don't worry. Uh, it is still returning a task of string. That's not what I was expecting. Okay. Oh, I need to invent this. Okay. Okay, that took me way too long to figure out. <laughs> there we go. Response is a string now. Uh, so, yeah, what did we do? We created a test server, an in memory server. We created a client for it, which is all the Nugget, uh, the ASP.NET integration testing uh, Nugget provides for us. And then we just call our root and we read response as a string. And this response variable has the string. And now we can verify that response equals hello world from zeta, something like that. So let's see this test fail first. Make sure that it's failing for the right reason. No application configured. That is true. We need to bootstrap our app. <laughs> We're starting a server without an app. Uh, so let's uh, uh, re register our app. And if you take a look at what how that would look like, uh, here you see this thing called webhost builder. That is exactly what we create in our test as well, webhost builder. So if we configure this webhost builder the same way uh, as we do in our uh, production code, it'll just work. <laughs> so actually, this function, this function is uh, what we need to do uh, call in our tests as well. So let's extract this function. I'm extracting this function here. And it's this part that we need. There we go. So, and this needs to be, we need to provide some type hints here because F sharp has no idea what we're trying to do. Now it does. And now it hopefully. Oh, no, it was just incorrect. There we go. Incorrect casing. There we go. So now we can use this configure function function instead of this lambda here. There we go. So we refactored our main code or production code, but now we have this function called configure. Let's call this. Let's put a module. Let's put all this thing in a module called uh, zi. Yeah, why not? So we have zi.configure. That sounds nice. And we have a zi.main function that's cool so if we call this configure now in our test when we configure our server it should do the same thing so we should be able to do zeti dot configure and let's not ignore the return value but let's return the return value so now it returns a web host builder as well it takes it as an input argument it configures it and it returns it You'll see this a lot in functional programming. And we don't need the result in our production code. Because that's the end of the line here. We just configured it. Uh, but here we kind of do. So let's say webhost builder. And then pipe that to the configure function. So now we get a configured webhost builder as a result. And let's pipe that in our test server. Or I can even do uh, this actually. Create the webhost builder and configure it and inject that into the test server, stuff like that. So yeah, now we have a configured webhost builder. Now we should be able to run our own app in that in-memory server. Let's see if that works. 
It's failing, but it's failing for the re correct reason. We don't have the correct returned text. So we should have a low zeti user as a result. Ooh, the suspense. Okay. <laughs> so now we have a working test. Um, it's a bit verbose, but once we have two, three of these tests, we'll clean it up so it reads like the English prose, I promise you. Uh, but before we do that, that's something for our next episode. Let's do a quick recap. Um, we are just started building our functional web API, Zetai, which will manage to-do lists. Um, for that, we created a new uh, Giraffe uh, backend. And the Giraffe backend looks something like this. So it's a single function that does some routing and dispatch dispatches to HTTP handlers that contain the business logic and know what to return. It's built on top of ASP.NET and get, it runs on the Kestrel web server. But this is box standard ASP.NET if you know it. And then we wrote uh, some uh, HTTP calls against it using HTTP files because that sits nicely along with the code. Uh, I can just press buttons to run it. I can even debug from this file, so that's pretty cool. And next up, before we get started writing our outer loop, double loop, test-driven development uh, functionality-wise, uh, I just wanted to wrap our walking skeleton into uh, a test harness, and that's what we did here. We used the ASP.NET Core test host package, and it takes three lines of code to configure the in-memory test server uh, running our own app, and then we can just call um, call or fire requests at it and take a look at responses. So this is actually running our entire code end-to-end. -end. We will, of course, will also be writing unit tests, but uh, this is a nice first step for our walking skeleton. And maybe the most important thing I forgot, I totally forgot how to do a task and a sync <laughs> combining those two. I do a lot of a sync, I do a lot of a task in C sharp, and I do a lot of a sync in F sharp, but I never or almost never do a, a sync or task to a sync conversion. So it took me a, a quick peek at uh, my solution <laughs> for this one. But we got there in the end and it's working. So I am happy. So yeah, that's it. Episode one. We have a walking skeleton. I hope you learned something. And more than that, I would love to see you again for episode two, where we'll be actually writing some business logic. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye.